Um, as humans, I think we are discoverers. We enjoy discovering things. That's why science is our thing. We want to know. We want to make discoveries. And when we make certain discoveries, we're usually convicted by it. More convinced by our own discoveries than we are with somebody else telling us about something. I think you've experienced that. So probably there's a brand that you believe in, a type of car or a type of clothing that you've discovered works for you. And then that's your thing. It becomes a conviction. And out of this conviction, you live. Now, when a baby is small, the first thing he or she discovers is that when you cry, somebody fixes the problem. So if you are hungry and you cry, somebody will give you food. Or if you're, something's uncomfortable in your nappy area, you cry and someone will clean that and it becomes better. So it's one of the first discoveries that we make, that when we cry, somebody gives attention to us. We need not stay at that discovery because it's not nice if... Grown-up people cry to get attention. But it's the first discovery that we make. The second discovery I think that we as young children all have made is that sweeties and cookies and chippies is a lot better and tastes a lot, lot better than food. Amen? Yeah. You've discovered that. That's a discovery. Another discovery, when you're in primary school, you discover that there's girls and there's boys. And Girls are different from boys, and you don't like girls, and if you're a girl, you don't like boys. That's a discovery. But when you get to high school, you make a new discovery about the same subject. Boys are boys, girls are girls, but you like girls, and you like boys, and you want to meet them. It's, it's part of life, discovering all the way. You discover when you become a teenager that your dad that you thought was so clever is actually very stupid. And, uh, but later in life, you make a new discovery that dad is actually very clever and very wise, and so is mom. But it's just this, this journey of discovery that we're on in our lives. Another thing, I think, when you're a young adult and you move out of the house, one of the first things you discover is that clothing doesn't wash itself, neither it irons itself. You must do it. You must take it to someone. Or you discover that uh, the dishes... It doesn't wash itself. You must do it. And petrol is the thing that your motor car needs to run on. And that's expensive. It's just a discovery. When you are newly wed, you also discover some things. You discover that telling the truth is the best thing for your marriage. Unless she asks you if a specific dress makes her look fat. Then you lie. He says, no, it makes you look very nice. That's on a lighter note. Listen, we are discoverers and we, we will always discover things. And I want to help you today to discover three things about your spiritual journey. And these three things can help you in life. And we're going to look at a psalm, Psalm 126, and it speaks of three discoveries. Just to put Psalm 126 into context, it's part of a group of psalms. There's 150 psalms, and there's different types of psalms. You get wisdom psalms, you get creation psalms, you get prayer psalms, you get praise psalms, you get thanksgiving psalms. You also get what they call psalms of lament, where, where the specific writer laments the situation, cries before the Lord. These psalms are part of what is called the Psalms of Ascent. Psalm 120 through to 134, they are called the Psalms of Ascent. What does this mean? It was psalms that they sang or quoted on their, on their way when they ascended up to Jerusalem, to the temple. Fifteen psalms. It's the Psalms of Ascent. Now, Psalm 126 is one of them. Let's read this psalm of ascent. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter 
our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with joy, with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. It's a well-known psalm. Probably have read it before, or parts of it. Now, this psalm divides into three pieces, or three parts. And the three parts are also three discoveries that we're going to make together this morning. The first one is verse 1 to 3. When the Lord changed our fortunes. So, it's about a great miracle that happened. God came through for them. A great miracle. Then you've got verse 4. It's the middle part of the psalm. There's a new problem. So there's a prayer again. There's a prayer in it. Restore us, O Lord, again. It's like they've moved from this place where God has gave them a great escape. A miracle happened. It was like a dream. And now they're in trouble again. Something new has occurred. So that's the second part of the psalm. And we'll make a discovery on that just now. And then finally, verse 5 and 6, a discovery whilst they're still in need. I hope by the end of today, you will see the psalm through new eyes. The first thing is, God is a miracle worker. Listen to this, the first word, verse. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. What's the discovery? God's a miracle worker. He can, in a moment, in a second, change the situation from bad to good, from hopeless to one of hope, from dark to light. That's the God we serve. He can do a miracle. Can I ask you, just as you are sitting there, can you recall such a moment as you are sitting? Maybe just nod. So I want you to recall it now. Do it now. Close your eyes for, for, for 10 seconds and go to that place. It was dark, it was hopeless, and then from out of nowhere, God just changed it. It's wonderful. That's the God we serve. A miracle working God. I remember earlier this year, two months ago, I experienced this. So if I were to go to that place, I went there. I was owning 70000 for my son's university fees. And I already paid 90000 in the last 12 months. And I was, there was no place to go uns, unless to go and make a loan. But when we embarked on this journey, we decided we're going to trust the Lord to do this. And he, up until then, he helped us. But we had a problem for him to go out and do his practical part of his training his accounts need to be settled. Otherwise, if they're not settled, they, they won't send him out. So I was in need. And we prayed and we asked God to come through for us. And, and you know how it is? Sometimes it feels like forever. It's not happening, it's not happening. And then one day I get a phone call from someone who was together with me in university, who only finished one year then Stopped his studies and he went into business. He said, how's your son doing? I said, no, he's fine. He's passed now and everything. He says, do you still owe money on that tertiary fund or fees? I said, yes, uh, in fact, I do. <laughs> and uh, as I was speaking to him, I said, this is not man. This is God at work. Because I'm not planting words in his mouth. He's just asking the right questions. So he says, how much? I say, 70,000. He says, text me the details, the bank details of the university. The next day, 
Settled, 70,000. Now, 70,000 may be nothing for some people, but it was for me a big deal. And it was just emphasizing again the fact that God is a miracle working God. He can change fortunes in a moment and it will be like a dream. Ever said the following? This is too good to be true. Maybe I'm dreaming. I need to pinch myself to see if I'm not dreaming or not. That's the way God operates. It's when the doctors are surprised. It's when somebody gets a job, when everybody said, no, in this country you won't get a job. It's when God gives you business, when He gives you favor, when He saves a relationship ship that is in trouble, where He saves a person that's far from Him and turns His life around. That's the miracle working God. It's like a dream. So the first discovery I want you to make today, together with this psalm, is that he's a miracle worker. And he's got the power and the capacity to change the situation in a moment. Tell it to yourself. He can change things in a moment. That's a discovery that we need to make. And sometimes we forget. Isn't it true? It's one of the biggest accusations that God brings against his people in the Old Testament. You are forgetting. You forgot. We easily forget. Did you know that Jesus actually multiplied the bread and the, the loaves and the fish twice? And after he'd done it the first time, everybody was so happy. So happy. And, and his disciples were witnesses seeing this miracle working God in action. A few chapters later, the same thing happens. And again, they doubt. He says, no, Lord, this is not going to work. There's too many people. It's too late. It's too far. We don't have enough money. That's the way we are. We've, we tend to forget. And, and please make this discovery this morning. And let it become a conviction in your life. He can do anything in a moment. It will be like a dream. You see, when you are in trouble, it brings with it a gift. Trouble always brings a gift to the children of God. What's that gift? It's the gift of no other options. It's a gift, I promise you, it's a gift. If you can receive the gift of no other options, you're in a good space. Because you're a candidate for a miracle. God can do something for you. If you've got options, you don't need God. If I had 70,000 in my bank account, why would I need God? Just do it. But, but with, when you've got no other options, please remember He's a miracle working God. And, and, and that you can discover this. There's this text in Psalm 119.71. It says the following. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decree. Sometimes when you're in trouble, you learn things. And I, I pray that one of the things that you will learn is that he can do the impossible. So that's the first thing. That's what the first part of the psalm teaches us in a moment. The second part of the psalm teaches us the following. Troubling times always return. After he's now magnified the Lord and gave praise to God for this big outcome, this big miracle. Verse 4. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Now, other translations say, Now, please restore. I'm in trouble again. Isn't that life? They say you're either before a crisis, inside a crisis, or just outside a crisis. <laughs> That's a positive word. Amen? Amen? You're so glad you came this morning to hear that? <laughs> either before a crisis, or in a crisis, or outside a crisis. But that's life. And if you, if you don't believe that, you run into trouble. Many people think that as Christians, um, we've got this sort of like a, you know, special treatment. So life will treat us differently because we're Christians. 
Now, I know that we have God's favor on our life. I know that God looks out for us, that uh, he's our healer, he's our protector, and all those things. But here's the thing. Christian children get sick and sometimes goes to the hospital and don't return. We saw during COVID, you know what? I heard a pastor speaking just when COVID hit South Africa. He said the following, no Christian will die from this. Because we think we get special treatment. We don't get special treatment. I'm in ministry now for 29 years. Next year it's going to be 30. And my wife stood beside me all the way. We worked. We did our thing. And then three years ago she got cancer. And um, the questions. Because we think that we need, we're going to get special treatment. And Praise the Lord, she went through the process. It wasn't easy. They had to remove one of her kidneys. She had to go through therapy afterwards. But she's clean now. And, and thanks be to God. But there are people that don't get healed. So I asked her, her name is Annette. So I said, Annette, tell me, what did you learn from this? And I thought it's going to be something very spiritual. It was just the following. I'm not more special than the person next to me. Even though I've been serving the Lord for so many years, stand beside my husband in ministry for 30 years, I'm not more special than the person next to me. Life comes and knocks on all of our doors. And if you are trying to, to, to serve God out of this idea that He will always make good things happen to you, you're going to be disappointed. Because bad times will return. Troubling times always return. Even though God changed their fortunes. And even though it was like a dream. They're now in trouble again. That, that place again. And I want you to make that discovery this morning. It's not a discovery of, of doubt. It's not a discovery of you know, not having enough faith. It's got nothing to do with it. It's realism. It's realism. They say the pessimists sit in the boat and complain about the wind. The optimists sit in the boat and, and, and wishes and prays for the wind to change. But the realist goes and adjusts the sail so the boat can go. So I think it's a realistic point of view. Understanding that troubling times is part of the Christian faith. And that by embracing pain, you can, can grow. That's why David said, it, it was good for me to be afflicted. And, and we don't like this, especially when we are Pentecostal or charismatic in nature. We want to sing rejoicing songs and, you know, God is on the throne and God is good all the time. And we all believe that. But let's face it, there's troubling times in all our lives. And, and then he, he prays, restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. What does this mean? Now, Negev is the desert part of Israel in the south. And when you drive in your car in the south, you'll find that you go through little river crossings. Many river crossings. But it's dry rivers. You're in a desert. It's desert all around you. But every now and then you cross a little bridge and it says, beware of flooding in Israel. And, and it doesn't make sense. Beware of flooding. You're in a desert. I'd rather say beware of the sun. But it says beware of flooding. And the story, people that stayed there for many years, I know two engineers in my, my assembly, they stayed in, in, in Israel. And they say that when it rains, a little thunderstorm, can create floods in that area due to the way that they call it wadis. It's almost like small river streams. And it caused flooding that within half an hour, all the bridges are flooded. And he, and he uses this, he says, Lord, as quickly as you change the desert into a flooded area, 
Change my fortunes. Because you can. But as long as we live in denial regarding our pain, regarding our trouble, we cannot come to this point to say, Lord, change it like streams in the negative, negative desert. They say that all crises or storms that we face has got the following in common. Firstly, it starts off very calmly. For us to have a storm, we need calm waters. Otherwise, it's not a storm. Does that make sense? Very philosophical. We need calm waters. So your life is sorted out. Everything is happy. But then there's a build-up. All of us have been through this. Something happens, and then there's a blow-up. Something big happens. And then you go and make plans, and you negotiate, and you try to get out of this crisis. Uh, you look at your options. We've all been there. But, and then there's a solution, or you get some form of a relief. And, and you know what they say about a crisis? The final step. You make new discoveries. Isn't it true that you learn more in dark times than we learn in sunshine times? <laughs> you know, plants need the sun to grow. Humans are different. We sometimes need darkness. Dark times. Difficult times. To really grow. And we make new discoveries. And, and you know what? We as Christians, we, we've got this, you know, Harry Houdini was this escape artist. We're like, all like Christian Houdinis. We want to escape from the crisis. Take us out of this crisis immediately. We don't want to go through the process of the discovery. And if you don't go through the process of the crisis, you will never make discoveries. We can't escape. That's why they all say the following, and it's probably the most spiritual thing that we can believe as Christians. Never waste a crisis. Never waste a crisis. Go through it. Learn. Wrestle with God. Allow Him to be in your life because you never know. The negative can change into streams of overflowing. But you must go through it. Don't try and escape. So, first discovery, God can change our fortunes like this. Second discovery, troubling times often return. It's part of life. And don't get bowled out or bowled cleanly when troubled comes. Work with it. Go to the Lord. Don't turn your back on the Lord. Go to with, struggle with Him. Get the answer. And then finally, sowing despite or in spite of. Um, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Now, I always understood this wrongly. I thought it was those who cry, they will reap. So if I cry a lot, because of my difficult times, I will reap a lot. No, no. Those who sow tears, no. Those who sow with tears. Meaning, regardless of the fact that you are going through a difficult time, if you are willing to put seed in the ground, that's a good thing. Because God can change fortunes in a moment, first discovery. Second discovery, troubling times may return. What do you do if God doesn't change the fortunes immediately? You keep on showing up sowing in spite of the tears, in spite of the difficulty. Look at the next verse. Um, those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, meaning that it's difficult for me to, to do this. But still sowing will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. If you're willing to do the due diligence, the hard work, putting in, even though you don't feel like it, even though there are tears, even though you're in the middle of this crisis, God will open a door. God will, will help you to reap. This week, I listened to a speaker, um, and his lecture was six words. And I think it's six words that we as Christians need to take heart. Wake up, grow up, show up. In life, we need to wake up. Wake up for what? Wake up to the fact that it's, there's more to life than just me. 
More to life than just my small world. There's a God that loves me. There's a God that wants to be in a relationship with me. There's this wonderful creation all around us. You know, most recently, the last three years, ever since COVID, and just before COVID, I started to wake up to the fact that God is in the ordinary All around us, if you look out here, he's in nature, he's in the ordinary. But what do we do? We keep on seeking him just in the extraordinary. He's there, he's in the supernatural, absolutely, that's our God. But he's also in the natural. And here's the thing, he's more often to be found in the ordinary than in the extraordinary. The extraordinary is the, is the miracle. It's when he changes the fortunes. When you feel him, he's here. He's, but often he's not. You don't feel him. But if you can be alert to the natural, he's in everything. He's in the smile of your husband, of your daughter. He's in your neighbor. He's in that tree, that bird's. Ever since I became 50, I'm, be I'm becoming aware of birds. So my wife and I are bird watchers. Yeah, it's, it's an old person thing. Um, so when, we, when we're in the Kruger, we stop and people will stop. Where? Where's the line? Where's the line? No, no, we're looking at that little bird in that. Oh, and then they go. But yeah, it's, it's just an awakening to God, to wake up to God everywhere. Experience him in, in everything. Um, you know, spirituality is about being firmly connected to earth and also connected to heaven. But we think spirituality is just heaven. Just the worship and just the goosebumps and, 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 and you know, the godly encounters. So that's spirituality. No, spirituality is also grounded in the earth. In, in, in being, that, the, the narrative of, of, of creation in Genesis 2, what does it say? And God took from the dust of the earth, aretz, that's the Hebrew word, aretz, he took aretz. And he breathed into man the breath of life, ruach. The spiritual thing, but also the Aretz. And he became a living Negev, being. So being spiritual is all about being grounded here in earth, but also be there. If you only live here, it's, that's, that's an unbalanced spirituality. If you only live up here, it's also unbalanced. So, and and to be a being, what does it entail? It means to be grounded, but also connected. It means aretz and ruach. Being is a combination of aretz and ruach. So wake up to the aretz also, not just to the ruach, not just to, to the godly things. Wake up to God in the earthly things. Amen? Difficult. Getting light? It's true. So wake up, then grow up. Grow up. Learn the lessons of life. Go through it. Don't be a spiritual baby. Babies are cute. Even their selfishness is cute. You know, when they're small and they laugh and no mind, no mind, and it's cute. Only up till 18 months, then it's not cute anymore. An adult, selfish adult is not cute. So grow up. And then show up. And the, this is the thing that we are struggling with, to show up on a continuous basis. Keeping on doing the right things at the right time, even though you are in a difficult time. Um, one of my favorite verses, Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good. Showing up means showing up on a regular basis, not just once. Um, 
doing good, sowing the right seed despite the tears that I'm having. Now, we often say the following when it goes well in an assembly, we say, God is blessing our assembly. Does that mean that the assembly that's not doing well, that God doesn't bless them? I think it's arrogant. What we actually must say is, what are we doing that God can bless? Are we doing the right things? Are we putting the right seed in the ground? So, so that's the essential of it. Um, for at a proper time, it may not be now, but if you keep on showing up, keep on putting seed in the ground, sowing despite of your tears, or in spite of your tears, you will reap. But you need to show up regularly. And do not give up. You don't have to do a good thing. It's good often to do a good thing. But it's better to do a good thing often. <laughs> you know the, the New Year's resolution at the beginning of the year? We all want to diet and exercise. So we eat salads and we walk and we run and we exercise. But by Valentine's Day, we're back on chocolates and... So it's good to do a, a good thing once, but it's when you do a good thing often, when it becomes a habit in your life, when you will reap. It's the same with putting seed in the ground, sowing despite your tears. Um, this picture, Muhammad Ali and George Foreman, 1974. It was called the biggest fight ever at that stage, biggest sporting event. It was held in King Shasha. Now the Republic uh, Democratic DRC, Demo yeah, DRC. <laughs> and um, he was two years um, not boxing and he made a return and, and, and this is where he knocked Foreman out. And Ali said afterwards, the fight is won or lost far away from witnesses. Behind the lines, in the gym and out there on the road, long before I dance under those lights. God can bless us, but are you willing, when you're on your own, far away from the lights, to keep on putting the right seed on a regular basis in the ground? And that's the third discovery. The first one is, yes, he's a miracle worker. The second one is, sorry, troubling times will return from time to time in our lives. But what do you do? Are you willing to keep on putting seed in the ground, despite of your circumstances. And I think this is the three things that this psalm will teach us. And I want to invite you. Uh, I don't know what you do in this week during your quiet time, what, but why don't you meditate for the whole week on this Psalm 126 and the three discoveries? Don't do it. Meditate on it. And, and, and can I advise you? If you, haven't, if you don't do it yet, introduce it to your quiet time. Write. Journal. Journal what you sense, what you experience. The great thing about a journal is not in the moment. It's three months later. You can see, oh, here's a pattern. I can see the voice of the Lord. Ever heard that expression? I can see the voice of the Lord. That's what journaling does. So I invite you in this week, journey with us. I want to send you home with this word. He can change fortunes like a dream. That's our God. He's done it before. He will do it again. And maybe your next crisis will be one of those. But if it isn't, keep on showing up, putting seed in the ground until he comes through for you. And if he doesn't come through for you, at least you'll grow and make new discoveries. And maybe that will bring you spiritually in the place for bigger miracles in your life. When God changes our fortunes, it will be a dream. It will be like a dream. Maybe it's a quick dream sometimes. It's a long dream.